let, let's yes. let's shift gears a little bit and talk about your past um, because I have a couple of kids who are now up and out in and into the workforce and they're going to you know hopefully find their way through a successful path despite the pressures of uh, of AI and so forth it, how did you how did you what are some of the decisions you made along the way so you've had a very uh, interesting career I mean and now you're CEO of a, of a startup effectively I mean talk a little bit about decisions that you remember making that led you here versus leading you potentially to somewhere else? Yes, no, definitely. So uh, I was always uh, interested in uh, math in high school. Uh, it was, it, I always found it very fascinating. I, uh, I was, uh, I guess, one of the uh, people who liked really doing the proofs more so than, than uh, really doing the exercises because I thought that was uh, a lot more interesting. And so that ultimately led to me studying uh, uh, mathematical economics or econometrics and engineering. I actually wanted to, my first major was to go into engineering, mechanical engineering, to be precise, because I um, wanted to build uh, rocket ships. Uh, and I, uh, and I, th I thought oh, this, this was very, very interesting. And I remember I had a uh, professor, uh, an economics professor at uh, NYU, uh, I'm sorry, at uh, Syracuse at the time for undergrad school. Uh, and he said, hey, uh, if you can solve a linear set of equations, there are these things called derivatives that are uh, being traded on Wall Street, and that's who Wall Street is hiring now. Um, and so is that something that you are interested in? And, and when I was in high school, I, I'm dating myself here, but I, I remember I used to listen, my brother and I, we used to listen to Louis Rokeiser in Wall Street Week uh, on Fridays. Uh, that used to be on PBS. Uh, and so I, I, I always had this interest in, in, in Wall Street, but I uh, never thought I would end up there. And so I uh, graduated and then went to uh, work on Wall Street, uh, of all places, and so started doing that. Uh, and I worked at a few institutions, uh, uh, primarily on the quantitative side, um, ultimately in uh, market risk, credit risk, and trading. Uh, and I, I started getting a little bit bored with that, uh, uh, and uh, I took a job as a consultant, uh, uh, working for, uh, at the time, a firm that I thought were doing some fairly uh, innovative uh, uh, IT, uh, IT capabilities that they were building it was founded by a couple of professors out in California. And they were looking at ways to apply Monte Carlo simulations to solve some risk management uh, uh, problems. And so I went and worked there. Um, that allowed me to travel around the world, which I was part of what I was uh, looking for. So I ended up uh, working uh, on a uh, risk solution in Shenghan in uh, South Korea, for example, for Shenghan Bank uh, at the time. So I was in, uh, and I enjoyed that. Uh, and so that took me around the world. And so I'm, I was like, well, this technology thing sounds like fun. Uh, I want to stay there a little bit uh, longer. And so I bounce around uh, a few technology companies. Mostly, and, mostly in financial services. Mostly in financial services. Mostly uh, in financial services. I was head of uh, financial engineering for a company called uh, Numerics, for example, where uh, there we were uh, trying to solve, build uh, models that could uh, that traders can use to uh, price fairly complex products. Um, like a Himalayan option, uh, a dual currency, cross currency, swap with a range of cool. Uh, the the, the uh, technology like innovation in financial services was legendary from two thousand. Really, over the past twenty five years, I would say it's been it's been remarkable how financial services ha firms have leveraged technology and modeling in order to just improve returns. I mean, across the board. Yeah, and so a lot of the math uh, from engineering uh, carries over uh, to a lot of the work that was being done uh, in quantitative finance uh, at the time. 
because of my background in, in econometrics, although we were calling it econometrics at the time, but uh, really it was kind of like the first generation of these AI models uh, where you were looking at different kinds of uh, regression and regression on analysis and trying to explain uh, what a regression model uh, was doing. As a matter of fact, these uh, uh, all of these large language models are based on this notion of autoregressive uh, uh, modeling capabilities. Uh, uh, and so uh, that then led me uh, back to uh, finance uh, a little bit. I was working at a uh, company that ended up getting sold. Uh, it was also a startup uh, where I was the North American CEO for this uh, UK-based company, Edinburgh, so Scottish-based uh, company. Um that ended up uh, being sold. Uh, and then after that, I did uh, a few consulting projects. And then uh, the opportunity came up at uh, Fidelity uh, about four years ago uh, when the lab was going through this uh, transition. Uh, and when I came in, I uh, there was a role, but there wasn't uh, a job. Uh, there was just this notion that reg tech, regulatory uh, compliance technology was a thing. Um, and so um, what the lab was looking for was more or less an entrepreneur in residence to come in and say, hey, what are some of the things that we should think about building in this space? Um, and so uh, there were many ideas that we were thinking about, and we settled on this one, presented it to uh, the investment committee uh, as something that we think is worthwhile to do. Uh, but that's... Uh, at some point, you can apply it to other industries as well. So, so some of the folks that we talked to say that you know one of the one of the better things that they decided as they were moving through their career was to work on the client, work for clients at, at, in projects, because you really do start to understand the need to to build for uh, a particular well customer or, or or effectively an audience, uh, even if it's an audience of one. Versus just being kind of a contributor uh, in a large organization where you're kind of just performing your role very well, um, and certainly there's value there. I mean, did you? Was there any particular um, type of role that you that you thought? You know, I'm glad I did that because that's really allowed me to to see what products need to look like, or or work with people differently, or 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 work maybe better on the sales side? I mean, what, what was your experience there? Coming up on, uh, or growing up, I should say, on uh, more of the technical side. And then uh, for one of the earlier technology companies that I uh, was working for, uh, I was the person that the sales team would bring to client meetings to have the technical, here's how this model works versus that model. Uh, and I think through that process and sitting down with clients and listening and understanding uh, what uh, they are trying to solve and working with them in terms of the best way to solve that, uh, those earlier lessons uh, have been invaluable in terms of when you are thinking about uh, a product, you need to think about who's going to use it first and foremost and go and speak with those people, uh, uh, because you're not solving it for yourself. Ultimately, you're solving it. Uh, you know, you're trying to solve it for uh, a broad uh, group of people. And so, I think the skill sets that I learned through that process of being really uh, the technical sales engineer, so to speak, uh, working with some terrific sales leaders, that also allowed me to learn the sales side uh, of the business. And at some point. In, uh, one of the things that I uh, didn't mention uh, in one of these iterations at a technology company, I was actually uh, in sales. And so I had a quota. <laughs> I took care of a quota and go and it. speak with clients. And, and, uh, and I, used to have the, I used to have the, the, the full head trash around, I'll never do sales. I'll never do sales. You know, I think everybody kind of thinks of sales from a certain perspective early on that, you know, that's not something I'm really want to be doing and, and that's not for me. But then when you, when you're kind of forced into it, and I was forced into it uh, in a, in a, in a roundabout way, you begin to realize it's, it's an absolute great piece of experience. 
No, it is. And also, I mean, I what I always tell uh, even my, uh, my engineers is that if your company builds a product, you work in sales. You may not be client-facing, but if your company builds a product that somebody else is going to buy, you work in sales. Um, and so I've always had that mentality uh, uh, because to me, uh, I think uh, a lot of times people don't want to talk to sales people, but I think it's, it's a question of approach, right? I think approach the right way to your point, I think it's just an incredible experience in terms of uh, you learn a lot through that process by just listening to clients and working with them and trying to sell their needs and understand that ultimately uh, whatever you build, it's uh, for the benefit of the client. Uh, because if you don't have any clients, well, you're not gonna, <laughs> you know, you don't have to worry about the rest. So what? So so what do you look for? So as you're building out the business, um, what do you look for in terms of characteristics uh, that are that are kind of must have in a, in a candidate, regardless of the position? Do you try to unearth very specific personality types, or or uh, or try to? Are there any specific questions that you ask that you think you can get um, somebody to reveal themselves? Or what what is the what is the right fit for uh, a, an employee and safer these days? I think the right fit is someone who cares about the client experience. Uh, and so we spend a lot of time and effort uh, with clients to try and understand how they're using the product, what is working, what is not working. Uh, and so we look for people who, who can sit down and have that conversation with the client, no matter what function that they are in. Because a lot of times we'll go to a client meeting where it does require an engineer to be in front of the client and speaking to the client about a specific aspect of the product. Uh, and so uh, that, re- that skill set uh, cuts across the entirety of every function that we have in the company, uh, whether it's in marketing, whether it's in direct sales, whether it's engineering, uh, whether it's in the data science. Uh, as a matter of fact, by nature of what we do, uh, all data scientists have to speak with clients. Uh, and so consequently, uh, that's one of the key skill sets that we look for. And then obviously, depending on the function, if someone is going to be writing Java code, for example, well, yes, they need to know Java, right? Uh, but I, I, I would say that uh, uh, the ability for you to understand and be willing to sit and learn the client journey, uh, no matter no matter how, how many times you've been through it, it shows up differently with different clients. And so that ability to sit patiently and think and listen uh, and ask questions and be curious, that's what we look for uh, because, again, uh, given the uh, we're a small company, given our, our size, the only way that we're going to grow um, is to uh, solve real world problems, and you can only do that by listening to people with those real world problems. It's interesting you mentioned uh, they need to be able to write Java. In 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 truth, in very short order they won't need to be able to write <laughs> Java. <laughs> but they will yes. need to have a certain amount of soft skills, if you will, that, that kind of... I mean, obviously, they want to be able to prompt properly and, and be able to QA sure. and, and, uh, and, and architect. But the, the raw coding, actually, I think is, yeah. is going to end up going away. But I'm curious about... Um, because I think about it a lot here. Um, you know, culture, cult, company culture. How do you... How do you um, get people kind of on the same page? I don't know uh, whether everybody at Safer, it's almost nobody these days has everybody in office, but how do you think about culture when you when you start to hire folks who might not necessarily be coming in every day and and uh, and and kind of you know drinking the same Kool Aid? <laughs> yes. Well, I mean, I think that it's 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 the set of uh, beliefs that you have, right? Culture starts from the top. I think that you have to model the behaviors that you expect people to uh, uh, follow. Um, and so in, in, in our case, uh, yes, you are quite right. I mean, 
uh, we started, uh, uh, we presented the use case to the investment committee in uh, late fall 2020. So full on pandemic. So uh, the yeah. idea was basically right. five slides that we presented. Once the funding uh, for that was approved, uh, I started hiring. Uh, so the entire team that built the product was hired via Zoom. The entire uh, company, we had never met uh, uh, a single person. Uh, I, I met, uh, actually, when I started uh, at the lab, three days later, we all started working from home. And so I had met the person who ultimately became my first product manager for about an hour. And that was the only person that I had met. Uh, at that point, he was in another function uh, within the lab uh, that I had met. Uh, uh, the CTO, everyone uh, in the company that actually built the product. So we spent 2021 building it. Everything was still on lockdown <laughs> uh, in 2021. And so consequently, how do you get people to uh, buy into and believe, not just buy into, but believe in the culture? I think uh, we were at an advantage because Fidelity has a great culture to start with. And so I think that uh, we were able to uh, learn from that uh, uh, as well and impart uh, that culture onto uh, the safer team. Uh, but what makes us different, uh, as you might imagine, uh, uh, from the rest uh, is that uh, of the firm is that uh, we have to move faster because we're not a huge, <laughs> huge company where you have a small team. Fidelity's right? pace is a little <laughs> right? bit different. Your, your small team of, uh, uh, at the beginning, it was just eight of us trying uh, to build an MVP and get it, it out of the door. Uh, and so consequently, we looked for people um, who had that same mentality, people who came from a startup uh, background, people who were used to that, uh, who can work with a lot of ambiguity. Because big companies provide safety, they are well-defined processes, uh, you know, there's less chaos and less ambiguity. Small companies, lots of chaos, lots of ambiguity, and so people can work uh, in that type of environment, that was uh, crucial. So taking that and pairing that with the great culture that Fidelity already had in place was kind of like the perfect uh, scenario uh, for that. And uh, the support that we were able to get from uh, Fidelity with Lodge also helped uh, tremendously. Yeah, Val, this uh, this was great. Um, it sounds like tremendous opportunity, and uh, it sounds like you're off on a on a great path with Safer. Uh, Best of luck. Um, we're going to keep tracking you here at Solutions Review. Uh, we appreciate all the time you've given us. And uh, and yeah, best of luck for the rest of the year and, uh, and going forward uh, with Safer. Thank you. Thank you. And stay tuned. I think we have a lot of exciting announcements uh, coming up in the next uh, few months. So stay right. tuned. Great. Excellent. Thanks. Bye. Thank you.